start with the topic that is functional GI disorders. Now, this is a very huge topic. Uh, so for all clinical and practical purposes, I have divided it into two parts. That is the upper GI part, that is functional dyspepsia. And I'll be covering the diagnostic criteria, pathophysiology, what are the challenges which we face, what is the role of H. pylori, and an overview of management. A small word on bloating and belching, which we see in common day-to-day -day practice, and also covering functional constipation. What are the demographics in Indian scenario? How is it different from the Western scenario? What is the diagnostic criteria? And after you establish a diagnosis, how do you manage and work up, investigate these patients? Now, if you look at the term dyspepsia, it comes from the Greek, Greek word that is known as bad digestion. It can include early satiety, burning, vomiting, epigastric pain, or symptoms such as abdominal fullness, abdominal discomfort, and nausea. Now, if you see by and large, the common causes of dyspepsia, 70% are functional or known as non-ulcer dyspepsia. That is, an endoscopy will be negative for any organic pathology. Few of them are going to have some amount of reflux, gastroesophageal reflux disease, or any acid peptic or any ulcer disease. Very few, that is less than 5%, will have an early GI malignancy or an advanced GI malignancy. So, of course, it is important to screen this patient, but also you have to look in whom you have to screen. Now, if you look at the pathophysiology of functional GI disorders, if you take any organic GI disorder, the primary do domain would be an alteration in the organ morphology. And the diagnosis will be made by histology, pathology, radiology, or even endoscopically. If you look at an endos uh, motility disorder, the primary domain of involvement would be the organ function, which is going to result in altered motility. And the diagnosis would be made by motility studies, that is manometry, for example, for aplasia cardia. Whereas in functional GI disorders, there is a diagnostic criteria. The primary domain is illness experienced by the patient. And you won't be finding any abnormal lab pathology or an abnormal radiological pathology or for that matter, an abnormal endoscopic pathology. So these are usually diagnosed uh, by excluding all these organic and motility disorders. The diagnostic criteria is well established and accepted throughout the world. That is the room for diagnostic criteria for functional GI disorders. Okay, so epigastric pain syndrome and postprandial distress syndrome. If there is presence of bothersome epigastric pain or epigastric burning and the symptom onset is at least six months prior to diagnosis and symptoms should be active for the past three months. And mind you, there is no evidence of any structural disease. That is an endoscopy is negative. So these are diagnosed as epigastric pain syndrome. Same for postprandial distress syndrome. There is postprandial bother bothersome fullness and bothersome early satiety. So these are two different entities as per the diagnostic criteria. And these have been renamed nowadays as disorders of brain-gut interactions rather than functional dyspepsia. But having characterized them using a diagnostic criteria, it doesn't hold true in clinical practice. There is going to be an overlap. Indian study has shown that up to the tune of 60%, there will be overlap between these two syndromes. So patients will have overlapping symptoms of both the diseases. How, what is the pathophysiology? Normally, after any meal, there is fundal, fundal accommodation. That is, the fundus is going to relax and the food is going to get stored over there and slowly it will get digested so that you can ingest more and abnormal motility, there will be impaired fundal accommodation. And so after this redistribution, the stretch receptors will get activated, they'll signal the brain, and there will be a feeling of early satiety. This is the pathogenesis of postprandial distress syndrome. Other associated symptoms which can be seen and other pathophysiology, that is delayed gastric empty, emptying. If there is hypersensitivity to gastric distension, that is the antrum is being distended because of food. This is going to cause epigastric pain and belching. Impaired accommodation we have discussed. H. pylori can result in epigastric pain. Also due to excessive gastric acid secretion. 
there will be duodenal acid hypersensitivity because this uh, acid is going to go into the duodenum and the duodenal mucosa is fairly hypersensitive sensitive to uh, gastric acid and is going to cause a symptom of nausea so these are various pathophysiological mechanisms by which uh, this all the symptoms of dyspepsia can be justified if you look at the role of gut microbiota there, there is some evidence of small bowel inflammation that is going to alter the gut microbiota and this is eventually going to cause change in the bile acid pool also vice versa that is change in reduction in bile acid uh, levels for whatever reason it might be can alter the small intestinal microbial diversity and there will be overgrowth of pro inflammatory bacteria which are going to cause inflammation so inflammation leading to change in bile acid pool or change in bile reduction in bile acid leading to inflammation either ways all the good bacteria will be demolished in the small intestine and there will be an overgrowth of small intestinal uh, pro inflammatory bacteria condition which is usually termed as small intestinal bacterial overgrowth now what are the challenges with clinical presentation these patients are usually hyper vigilant that is they will have symptom anticipation and they will be constantly at the back of their mind they will be waiting for the symptoms to arise apart from that there will be visceral hypersensitivity that a small amount of pain will be perceived as a very significant pain and associated with gastroduodenal sensory motor abnormalities which we have discussed so because of this there is going to be a varied clinical presentation one suit is not going to fit all patients will have overlap symptoms same patients with same diagnosis going to present with different clinical presentation at each visit similarly there is a overlap of functional dyspepsia what the two entities which we discussed earlier with gastroesophageal reflux disease in up to the tune of 40 to 50% of patients so if you do an endoscopy patients will have evidence of gastroesophageal reflux disease on endoscopy but they are going to have an overlap of functional dyspepsia also so both can go hand in hand and early satiety can occur in both and differentiating between the two without without an endoscopy is a challenge so what are the symptoms which we need to look for what are the alarm symptoms as we call them that is unintended weight loss if the age is more than 45 years patient is having especially a male in indian context is having anemia if there is presence of fever or any palpable abdominal mass the symptoms are present during the night that is the presence of nocturnal symptoms if there is a family history of any gi malignancy or if there is visible gi occult blood which is seen so these are the symptoms which we need to look for however usually if these symptoms are present that means the patient has presented to us in a very later stage of the disease so these are not picking up uh, these are not useful for picking up early gastric cancers coming to the important pertinent question that is when do you need to test for h pylori h pylori if you see the prevalence in western countries the prevalence is up to the tune of less than 20% which is significantly less in this scenario it is justified and the guidelines mention that a empirical anti secretory therapy that is a pro pti proton pump inhibitor can be given and if there is no response then you can go ahead with an endoscopy whereas in a country like india but there or a patient comes to you with dyspepsia you can go ahead and which is going to be a dominant and uh, which is going to be present in a large variety of population okay normally in western scenarios uh, endoscopy is quite expensive so that is not the preferred modality you can go ahead with a fecal antigen test or a urea blood test however in india the cost is more or less same for all these procedures so any choosing any of this procedure is not going to make a chocolate difference management broadly if you see management uh, is based on uh, treating them with ppis you can use a standard dose for four weeks then escalate to a high dose use of anxiolytics antidepressants use of prokinetic agents especially for post prandial distress syndrome dietary modification that is avoiding chili oily fatty food tea coffee 
H. pylori eradication whenever indicated, or when there are some herbal medications which have been tried. So, prokinetics are also useful drugs, but they are useful uh, in patients who have got post-prandial distress syndrome. Not all patients with dyspepsia. They are going to increase gastric motility, increase gastric emptying, and prevent the relaxation and reflux of gastric contents. Coming to bloating. Bloating is a subjective sensation of gassiness, that is trapped gas, or feeling of pressure of being distended without any obvious visible distension. That is, it is a subjective thing. Patient is going to feel distension. You cannot feel it with your hands on examination. Prevalence is seen in up to the tune you know, of 16 to 30 percent in the general population. So, the treatment would be mostly dietary restriction of non-absorbable sugars. This itself is going to cause increase in symptoms up to the tune of 81%. Other diet which can be followed is a low FODMAP diet. The role of gluten-free diet is not very well established in the Indian scenario. Okay. Probiotics can be used. Uh, antibiotics, rifaximin, yes. It has got a better symptomatic relief because that is going to take care of the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and reduce the bloating. Belching. It is sudden escape of gas from esophagus to the pharynx, which could be either audible or it can be silent. And important to uh, differentiate between the two types of belching, that is supragastric belching, in which there is a closed LES and the air will be swallowed against a closed, closed glottis. So the air is not going to enter into the trachea. It is going to enter into the esophagus. Once this air has been swallowed, in the presence of a closed LES, this air is going to be erupted or it can be belched out. So there is no presence of any gastric air. Now this happens because there is a transient increase in the uh, lower esophageal pressure. Okay. On the contrary, if you look at gastric belching, there is already a presence of some intragastric air. Now this air is going to escape in the presence of a relaxed lower esophageal sphincter, which we had seen in the case of supragastric belching, that the, the lower esophageal sphincter was contracted. Okay, So this is going to escape up against a closed US and then the real belching. Why is it important to understand the pathophysiology is because you need to differentiate between these two. Supragastric is a voluntarily non-reflux mediated, non-physiological, that the patient is doing this on its own. And it won't occur during sleep and it will have a high frequency that the patient is sitting in front of you and continuously every second he is burping. Whereas if you look at gastric belching, it is involuntary, it is physiological, acceptable and rarely it would require any medical attention. And the frequency is quite less. If you look, compare, if you have to make a diagnosis of these two, you have to use esophageal manometry. Now if you can see in this graph, in supragastric, uh, in gastric belching, there is a relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter because of which air has come up. Whereas in supragastric belching, the pressure of the lower esophagus is pretty high and there is no opening which is seen over here. And this black part which you can see, this is the impedance which is measured on manometry. So that is, uh, air is being swallowed and then it has been, the pressure increases and the pressure uh, because of which the air escapes. Treatment is usually speech therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, using the help of diaphragmatic breathing exercises or taking a psychiatrist consult.